This past year was very busy, and there were a number of big news stories, especially coming from Parliament Hill. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly covered many of those stories, and he joins us now to discuss our year-end review. Now, Brian, we had a $600 million federal election, skyrocketing inflation, and the bumpy arrival of vaccines. But you say the biggest story of the year that dominated headlines was COVID-19. Yeah, second year in a row that I'd have to say COVID-19 was the biggest story of the year because it touched on everything. It touched on the election. It touches on inflation. It, you know, the whole issue of vaccines and boosters is because of that. So, you know, I wish I'd never heard of COVID-19. I wish we could stop talking about it. It would go away. I think we're all in that boat. But it remained the biggest story of 2021, dominating everything, how we lived our life, how we voted, how we spent money, how we went about shopping, how we're building back our, our economy after the uh, the pandemic that, uh, that started two years ago now. So it... it was the dominant story in 2020. It continued to be the dominant story in 2021. Let's hope it isn't all the way through 2022. Now let's talk about that very expensive election. We know that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau wanted to call the vote earlier, but was thwarted. In the end, you say he found a way to use the pandemic to help him win? How was that? Absolutely. And, you know, before he was able to call the election, there were a couple of times where he wanted to go, including the fall of 2020 and in spring and er early summer of 2021. You know, the plan had been at one point, um, bring in the budget, campaign on it for a couple of weeks w without calling an election and then have a vote in June. They even had dates of June 7th, and June 14th picked out, but cases became too high. Um, at that point, we didn't have vaccinations. There were still a lot of deaths in nursing homes, and he simply couldn't pull the plug and call the vote. But when he did in August, it was the start of the fourth wave. And of course, you in Alberta had a really bad spike from end of August through September, and he campaigned on that. He used the spike in Alberta to campaign in British Columbia and in Ontario to say, if you don't vote for me, if you vote for the Conservatives, you'll end up like those evil people in Alberta. You can't vote Conservative because look at what Jason Kenney did. That's how he won in the end because he squeaked out seats that a lot of people had not been expecting. He moved you know, certain key demographics, in particular women, just by a couple of points that allowed him to win government with the smallest you know, percentage support of the popular vote in Canadian history. And he was able to do that by campaigning in B.C. and Ontario. He picked up more seats in B.C. than anyone expected, gave him enough uh, seats to hold on to power. It was all about COVID, all about the pandemic and campaigning against Alberta, where, strangely enough, his party won two seats. Now, inflation is a word that's been on everyone's lips. We've seen the price of gas go through the roof, groceries, rent. We saw inflation hover around 4.4% for a lot of 2021. Brian, Ottawa claims that COVID was the main reason for inflation. But do you buy that? No, not really. And, you know, it's bizarre that inflation has become such a big word. I remember when I was a kid, my mother going shopping and all the posters of inflation fighters. And, you know, that was the big push at the grocery store. We've got the lower prices. We'll help you fight inflation. And it hasn't been a huge issue in decades. It's popped up now and again, but not the way it was in the early 80s, not the way that we're headed now. Uh, so this is quite something to see. There are people who have never dealt with inflation like this in their lifetimes. Uh, the Liberals are trying to say part of this is the pandemic. And yeah, actually, they're trying to say almost all of it is the pandemic and supply chain issues caused by the pandemic. That's part of it. Absolutely, the pandemic is causing some of this inflation. Shortages of workers, shortages of supplies, the you know logistics operations around supply chains breaking down. That's all part of it, but that doesn't explain everything. That doesn't explain the rising cost of housing, which, as both the NDP and the Conservatives have pointed out, has skyrocketed since this government took office. The average home price going from about four hundred and fifty thousand across the country to over seven hundred and twenty thousand. Last time you and I talked about that, you said you'd like to see it without. Toronto and Vancouver included? Well, absolutely, but the prices have still gone up. This has gone from becoming what used to be a Toronto and a Vancouver problem to being a national problem. We're all over the place. People are saying, well, wait a minute. I used to be able to get a house for X. Now it's Y, and it doesn't make sense. So you can't just put all of this off on the pandemic. They're trying. 
Other parts of it are driven by the monetary policy of the Bank of Canada, the spending of this government, which has been higher than many of our comparable countries in the OECD. So there are a lot of reasons for this. You can't just say COVID, shake your hands or wash your hands of it and, and hope things get better. They've got to act. They've got to do something. You know, it's interesting. I have friends that live in Phoenix, Arizona. They say to me, we watch a lot of those uh, uh, home reno shows that you produce in Canada there. You know, some of the houses listed in Vancouver and Toronto, 1.5, 1.8 million, 700-foot bungalow built in the 1950s. It's falling apart. They say, you know what you can buy here in Phoenix for 1.5 million with swimming pools? My whole block, you know, I'm like, or just outside of Phoenix. I'm like, wow. <laughs> so it really puts things into perspective. Brian, we first learned of the virus two years ago. We've had vaccines for about a year. Do you think that this story will be with us through 2023? You know, it could be in some ways. I'm hoping that it lessens, but we're going to have to wait and see. You know, we've got this Omicron uh, variant that has arrived on our shores, and it spreads fast. I can tell you that just last Friday, uh, they were saying, well, 10% of uh, cases in Ontario now are the Omicron variant. Now it's over 30%. In the next couple of days, it will be more than half of the cases. But is it more severe? You know, some early data out of South Africa and the European Union says, no, it's much milder, especially if you're vaccinated. But the simple truth of the matter is we don't have enough data to know for sure, which is why people are on edge. So, you know, one scenario that I've, I've spoken to experts about is that if this is milder, especially for for people who've had uh, you know, one shot or a previous infection, then uh, you know, what we could see is that if it's a mild infection and it goes through a large part of the population, well then uh, herd immunity starts to build up. We start to get to the point where it's not really something that's going to, to dominate and, and fill our hospitals. And that's what everyone's always worried about. Not the case numbers anymore, it's the hospitalization. So that's the number to track for the next little while. If this is mild, then perhaps everything peters out in 2022 and by the summer, we are back to normal. I mean, I, I, I hate to think of what will happen if that's not the case. Ryan, the first vaccine doses arrived in our country about a year ago and were rolled out into nursing homes. Now we're on to our first, like, third doses. Now you've been chatting with some doctors. Is there any end in sight to vaccinations for COVID-19? Are we gonna get our sixth, seventh, eighth booster shots here? What the doctors that I've been speaking with are saying is that this will eventually become like the flu shot, something that uh, we get on a on an annual basis, that this is very much like, you know, some people still freak if you compare this to the flu. But look, the Spanish flu was the last huge pandemic that went through like this. And we still get flu shots. Spanish flu never went away, one doctor said to me last week. We just are used to it. It's not as virulent. But for people who are immune compromised, especially the elderly or people with certain medical conditions, you get the flu shot. You know, I'm pretty healthy, but depending on the year and if I'm near my doctor or at the pharmacy at the right time, I've gotten a flu shot as well. Helps give you some protection. And if you do get infected, you're not as sick. That's what they're saying is going to be the case with COVID-19. And hopefully as the years go on, fewer and fewer of us need it, much like the flu shot. You know, the uptake on the annual flu shot is not even 50% in a normal year. And let's hope that we get that way eventually with COVID-19. But yes, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be an annual shot. And, and that's not because the vaccines don't work. It's because of the type of illness that it is. It's a respiratory illness, much like the flu. And the, you know it works differently. And vaccines work differently than say, chickenpox or shingles or mumps. It, it's a very different disease, very different way the vaccine works. Brian, with a swearing in of U.S. President Joe Biden, Canada-U.S. relations were supposed to improve. Now you say in some ways it has, but in many other ways, including on the jobs front and trades front, it simply is not. Yeah, look, with Donald Trump, you always got the feeling that you weren't sure if he liked Canada. Um, you know, his attention was definitely elsewhere. And at times he seemed to want to pick fights. You know, his first fight with the supply management for dairy uh, apparently happened because he he found out it existed and the fact that it existed enraged him <laughs> and that started some of the the tariffs that we saw but at other times Trump simply used tariffs as a negotiating tool to try and get a, a better trade deal and we saw that during the NAFTA renegotiations with Joe Biden it's different Joe Biden isn't using tariffs and 
uh, different protectionist measures to get a better trade deal. He's using them because he believes in them, and he believes in a very protectionist view of America's economy. That's bad news for Canada, given how integrated we are. Whether we're talking about softwood lumber, we're talking about oil, we're talking about autos or potatoes and PEI, or yes, even the dairy industry under threat again, all of these things are in Joe Biden's sights, and we're not having a lot of luck. There has been talk on, on the auto fronts that maybe we have a, a comparable uh, you know, tax incentive to what the Americans have proposed, and, and it becomes North American wide. Well, if that's a solution, so be it. It, you know, it beats losing 400,000 jobs. But we've got all these other trade agents that we have to figure out. And, and figuring them out may require not talking to the White House like we have in the past, but talking more to Congress, talking to people in the House of Representatives and the Senate to get them to push back against their own president and, and even have Democrats say, you know what, you're hurting us as much as you're hurting the Canadians with what you're doing. We haven't had luck with that so far. I hope we have better luck uh, under the Trudeau government on this file in 2023. Now, there's no doubt that 2021 was a pretty tough year for the Canadian military. It began with allegations against a former chief of defence staff and continued throughout the year, culminating with an apology. Brian, how do things stand right now with our Canadian Armed Forces? Still in a bit of a shambles. I mean, can you believe how, as we were preparing for this, I looked back and I said, it, a, you know, a year ago now, Jonathan Vance had not retired. We did not have any allegations of sexual impropriety or misconduct against him. And how many chiefs of defense staff and temporary chiefs of defense staff or senior military leaders have we gone through since then? People who have lost their jobs over recent and or historical claims of sexual misconduct in the military. We just had the recent apology. Notably, it did not come from the prime minister. It came from the defense minister. As many pundits have pointed out, this is a prime minister who apologizes for anything and everything, but he would not do the apology himself for members of the Canadian Armed Forces and the failures of this and previous governments to make sure that they have a, um, a safe and productive work environment. So we're at the point where the apologies happened. They're talking about doing more, but we keep hearing about more allegations coming forward as well. There are too many claims of the old boys club. Uh, that people in the past have raised concerns, the military has invested, investigated itself and found no problems. You know, it's like the cops investigating themselves. We don't allow that to happen. We can't allow it to happen in the military. We've got to get this cleaned up because there are other big issues that the military needs to deal with that they're not able to deal with right now because this is seizing most of it. We haven't picked a fighter jet to replace the CF-18s that are damage that could be falling out of the sky at any point. We've got helicopters with cracks in them. The people that continue to serve are being asked to serve with unsafe equipment. All eyes and all efforts is on dealing with this uh, issue that should have been dealt with six years ago when they had the report, the Deschamp report, detailing what was wrong. They didn't fi fix it for six years. They tried to sweep it under the rug and the rug just got bumpier to the point where you couldn't ignore it anymore. Brian, banned words and phrases became a big thing this year. And I mean, CBC declared the word spooky was racist. Ontario Civil Service declared the term low-hanging fruit problematic. And colleges and universities around the country updated speech codes. Brian, have we become a little soft, maybe overly sensitive as a society? Or do you think this is justified? I, I, I think we've become a little too sensitive as a society. I mean, the CBC story that... Uh, came out first saying spooky is a racist word. Uh, their whole reasoning for that is that uh, spooky comes from spook, which is a Dutch-German word origin, meaning ghost. And at some point from the 1940s on, some people use that as a derogatory term for black men. Well, that's not how most people use the word spook or spooky. And so how do you take a, a word that everybody uses at Halloween and say, well, you, you can't say spooky because it's racist. Nobody's used it like that. I mean, unless you're hanging out with 90-year-old Klansmen, that's not a thing. And then the uh, Ontario Civil Service, when they put out their list and said we have to get rid of phrases, uh, the low-hanging fruit example, they said right in the document detailing why you need to get rid of this that, well, there's no actual connection to racism, but some people who have seen lynchings might be bothered by the term low-hanging fruit. I'm sorry, how they're not related at all. 
you're going to worry about somebody being triggered over something that's not related. Low hanging fruit is what you let the kids pick when you go apple picking. You know, it's it's easy to pick fruit. It has nothing to do with hanging people. So yeah, I think we've got too many civil servants. We've got too many people with not enough time on their hands. You know, while many of us were struggling during the pandemic, a lot of businesses trying to hang on. This is what an awful lot of bureaucrats were spending their time doing. Now let's invent reasons why words and phrases are racist so that we can ban them. Makes zero sense. Ryan, we only have about a moment left here, but I wanted to ask you about the Conservatives blasting the Liberals on Bill C-10, which they say would limit our freedom of speech and allow the government too much control of the internet. Now the bill is being brought back. Where does it stand now? Where are we at? Well, we're at the point where the, uh, the Liberals say that they're determined to bring it back. Will they bring it back in a different form? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping so. I hope they take some time to, to realize that uh, what they put forward last time was not what was there. Unfortunately, as several conservatives told me, they expected that they might pick up some votes off of this issue. They didn't think they did. I also think they didn't campaign very hard on it. It was a very popular issue in the lead up to the election. It didn't get a lot of play during the election. Maybe if they leaned on it more, some younger, younger voters who are worried about their social media feeds being censored by the government might have stepped up and said, you know what, I'm not voting liberal this time. But hopefully there was a lot of backlash from the left and the right. Hopefully this time they, they learn their lesson and bring back a changed bill because they say they're determined to do something. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks for doing a great job for us this year. Thank you, Hal.